The C-SPAN Civics Bus is traveling the country, visiting libraries, bookstores, festivals, and authors. Here are some of the people and places we visited. We are here with Susan Levine at the University of Illinois, Chicago, to talk about her book, School Lunch Politics, The Surprising History of America's Favorite Welfare Program. Susan, why did you think it was important to expose the behind the scene, the behind the scenes scene of school lunches? Well, I think that everybody who goes to school in America uh, eats a school lunch at some point in their life, and um, it's a very important program for child nutrition, and it's a very important program for poor children in this country. When and why did we start providing school lunches to children? Well, that's a good question. It's a long story. Um, uh, home economists provided school lunches for children in the early part of the 20th century in an effort to teach immigrant children how to become American. Um, in the Depression of the 1930s, um, many more poor children were showing up in schools, and teachers began to offer school lunches. And at that point, the government got involved with children's lunches because there was a surplus of agricultural commodities and in order to keep the prices down the government would buy up food and then distribute it to children. But it wasn't until after World War II that the federal government established a permanently funded national school lunch program. And you write that the program is flawed. What are, what are some of the current flaws? Well, the current flaws stem from the historical flaws. Um, and in my opinion, uh, they center around issues of funding because it costs some money to feed children nutritious, healthy food. Um, and the government still supplies uh, surplus commodities to schools and some kinds of uh, subsidies, some, some money subsidies, but it's never supplied enough to cover the whole costs, and so local communities have to uh, put in their own funds. And that's a recipe for inequality, because areas that can afford to subsidize better lunches do, and areas that don't, don't. And so there's, across this, the country, there's a good deal of inequality in the level of funding and the kinds of lunches that children eat. There are a lot of different programs outside of schools, including nonprofits, that use the free and reduced price lunches as a standard for serving children. Is that a fair way of, of serving children in communities? Well, it's a convenient way, and I think that in recent years it's become a kind of common measure for the level of poverty in a school. And I always thought that was kind of interesting, that poverty, the, the level of poverty and the level of subsidies for schools was based on lunch. Um, I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, and um, fair, I don't know, you know, it, it's, it's convenient, it's an easy way to measure what's going on in a community and in a school. What are the current qualifications to be eligible for a free lunch? You know, since I'm a historian, I, uh, you know, I don't know the specific um, qualifications. They, they differ state by state, and children um, qualify depending on their parents and their family income, and it's a percentage of the poverty level. Um, so there's free and then there's reduced price lunches. Um, and the, as I say, the, the qualifications, there's a national, a federal uh, minimum, and then states can um, uh, increase that if they want. What do you think the responsibility and relationship between school lunch programs and nutrition is? Oh, that's a really tricky question. It's very complicated. Um, there are, in fact, federal um, nutrition standards. Um, which are not insignificant, and they've been improved over the course of the school lunch, the history of the school lunch program. They're not what nutritionists today would prefer. They're not the best standards. But I would say that they're not bad. The problem really is that um, uh, the, some of the critics of the school lunch program um, don't understand the link between the quality of the food and the federal and the local subsidies. So that it's really easy to say, oh, children should just get organic foods and only the, you know, only fresh vegetables and so forth. But that stuff's a lot more expensive. 
Um, so I think there has to be a happy medium. And um, in fact, the, the federal nutrition guidelines um, aren't aren't as bad as people think they are. A lot of the some of the criticism of the meals in the school comes from the what they call a la carte items and the food outside of the school lunch um, subsidies. So do you have any ideas on how we can correct this, <laughs> how we can move forward? Well, um, I do believe that um, the public and the, uh, you know, people, the, uh, uh, you know, people who eat the, the the parents of children and just citizens in general should should lobby for um, more funding for school lunch programs and for adequate funding for organic meals for everyone. Um, uh, I also think that um, it's important for critics of the school lunch program to understand that it's not just a question of children making poor choices. It's a question of public policy and um, of public uh, responsibility. And how did you decide on, on your title, on the full title for this book? <laughs> oh, that was a long discussion and, you know, took a while. Um, school lunch politics, because the, the book is about the politics of the school meal, not just the food that's on the tray. Um, and the surprising history of America's welfare, favorite welfare program, because um, in many ways, the school lunch program became a welfare program over the course of its history. It didn't really start out that way. Um, and there were very um, unusually, unusual uh, coalitions that formed and odd bedfellows. Uh, for example, in the uh, establishment of the school lunch program, a very conservative segregationist um, Senator Richard Russell from Georgia actually sponsored the program and uh, ended up being the father of the school lunch program. He otherwise opposed federal funding for welfare programs in general. Um, and then again in the 1960s, there were odd bedfellows in that Richard Nixon, um, actually in the early 70s, Richard Nixon, a Republican, president was responsible for the expansion of the school lunch program to poor children. Um, and again, that's not something that you would always expect uh, from the history. And then finally, in the 60s as well, in early 70s, some of the nutrition, um, the, the anti-poverty activists and, uh, who were pushing for what they called a right to lunch for poor children also um, began to uh, consider privatization in the lunchroom because the public funding couldn't cover free meals for everyone. And so there's some uh, interesting ironies there as well. We've been speaking with Susan Levine at the University of Illinois Chicago on her book School Lunch Politics, The Surprising History of America's Favorite Welfare Program. Thank you. You can view Book TV programs, sign up for a weekly email of our schedule, and learn about upcoming programs at booktv.org.